By the turn of the century, it was evident that Russian society was in a state of transformation. Conscious of the growing economic and military power of other European states, the Tsarist government had taken the initiative in spearheading a plan of rapid state industrialization. It funneled money into rail building projects and invested in new industries, with the hope of making the Russian Empire competitive. While impressive, the consequences of this fast-paced development became quickly evident. By the 1890s, a new working class had come into existence with labor protests and strikes increasingly breaking out in cities. By 1914, Russia boasted a small industrial labor class of roughly 3 million workers. This, however, paled in comparison to an imperial population standing at 129 million. Russian society was overwhelmingly composed of peasant farmers. In the interior, the empire possessed a range of ethnic Turkic and Muslim minority groups scattered across Central Asia, and even nomadic populations inhabiting the steppe. While small, industrial workers in the city were nonetheless a vocal minority, and they were encouraged by labor organizers and a new generation of Russian Marxists to make their demands known. On top of this, a new generation of liberals was coming of age in Russia. Liberals demanded constitutional government, local self-governing institutions, and, most importantly, an end to the autocratic system of rule that had governed Russia since the 15th century. Democracy and civil rights became the battle cry of this group. And although they were not bent on revolution, Liberals did seek political reforms that would effectively pave the way for a representative government. In 1905, these various tensions came to the forefront of Russian politics in dramatic fashion. However, the events that would unfold were not generated by either the Liberals or Radical Socialists. In fact, they came from an unlikely source a St. Petersburg priest and prison chaplain named Father Gapon. By 1905, Father Gapon had become an instrumental leader in the worker movement. Through meetings held in tea rooms across St. Petersburg, the Orthodox priest organized an assembly of Russian factory workers. This body was dedicated to educating workers and instructing them in methods of organization and orderly protest. Certainly not a radical, Father Gapon hoped to promote a platform of labor reform. The word reform here was key. He was not a radical. Loyalty to Tsar and state were a chief responsibility of workers, in Gapon's estimation. In fact, his goal was to draw workers away from the radicals. He believed that if workers applied pressure on the state to carry out reforms, a new relationship between Tsar and people would take shape. More to the point, he felt it would compel the government to undertake a policy of state-sponsored reform that was neither radical nor revolutionary. On January 9th, Father Gapon led 20,000 of his followers in a protest march to the Winter Palace. There, workers made appeals to the Tsar for higher wages, better working conditions, and civil and political rights. All said, there was nothing overtly revolutionary in this march. However, greeting protesters at the palace was a line of armed soldiers. Upon seeing the crowd approach, the troops attempted to disperse the workers with rifle fire. In the process, 150 protesters were shot dead. The opposition dubbed the event Bloody Sunday. Reformers and workers alike criticized the handling of the protesters. In the aftermath, 
Workers stage mass strikes to show their sympathy for the victims. Public opinion turns sharply against the reigning Tsar Nicholas II in the coming days. And as the government failed to take effective measures to address this anger, others did. With the empire in a state of crisis, liberals seized the initiative. They began mobilizing support behind a platform of constitutional reform, holding mass rallies and leading calls of long live the constitution. They even organized a spirited banquet campaign, imitating French Republicans of the 1840s. At these banquets, participants sang the Marseillaise, toasted to liberty, and criticized the government. They argued that the Russian state was not the personal property of the Tsar. It belonged to the people. This constitutionalist platform drew a wide array of support that winter and spring. Journalists supported it in the press. Ethnic minorities within the empire championed constitutionalism, seeing it as a means of having their own grievances addressed. Workers staged mass strikes that paralyzed industries, attempting to wrest concessions from the beleaguered Tsarist government. In 1905, it appeared that Russia was on the brink of a momentous change, and many activists did not fail to hail the moment as Russia's 1789. With no other alternative, Tsar Nicholas II was forced to issue a manifesto that October promising a representative Duma and a turn toward constitutional monarchy. In reality, this was only a promissory note. Nothing binding was given, and for some, this symbolic gesture of capitulation was not enough. Liberals felt it best to take what was given and consolidate their gains within a new parliamentary system. Radicals, however, flatly rejected the offer, seeing this concession as an empty promise. As was clear, the revolutionary movement was beginning to splinter. Time, however, proved the radicals correct. No sooner had the Duma been called, then the heavy hand of the bureaucracy descended on the revolution. The Tsarist government reverted back to its autocratic policies, breaking up liberal groups and clamping down on worker organizations. By the end of 1905, the revolution had come to a demoralizing end. The enthusiasm of January was clearly dead. Despite its failure, the events in Russia drew the attention of Europe. Leftists and radicals commented on the strikes and street protests, prophesizing that Russia was on the verge of a political awakening. Even further afield, journalists and writers saw fit to comment on the events transpiring in Moscow and St. Petersburg. In particular, journalists in the neighboring Ottoman Empire took a keen interest in these latest political agitations. The Ottoman Empire was unique when compared with other European societies. It was a multi-ethnic and multi-confessional state, containing Jews, Slavic and Greek nationalities, Turks, Arabs, Kurds, and other groups. The empire had been stitched together over centuries of conquest, and by 1900, it stretched from the borders of Persia to the edge of Eastern Europe. The head of state, Sultan Abdul Hamid, claimed both temporal and spiritual powers, serving as the imperial sultan and the caliph of the Muslim world. Although the ruling dynasty was Turkic and the official religion of the empire was Islam, this did not imply the empire was a Turkish state. Ottoman never correlated with an ethnic Turkish identity. The empire itself was organized around the principle of the millet system. 
In this system of government, religious communities traditionally enjoyed a great deal of autonomy. Despite the empire's Islamic identity, Jews and Christians were permitted to worship freely and maintain their communities in exchange for paying a special tax. This policy passed for tolerance in an Ottoman context. However, over the course of the 19th century, the imperial system had begun to show significant signs of strain. Many forward-looking elites insisted it discouraged modernization. More worrying was the fact that minority groups within the empire had begun taking up nationalist platforms, a prospect that threatened to destroy the traditional multi-ethnic system. Given these difficulties, many began to speculate on what the future held. If the nation-state was the model of modern society, by comparison, the Ottoman Empire looked like a medieval state which favored religion over nationality and absolute rule over constitutional principles. In almost every way, the structures of the empire discouraged liberalism and modernization. Parliamentary politics was deemed unthinkable, as it would encourage ethnic squabbles and separatism. How could modernization begin when there was no centralized bureaucratic structures in place? This perceived backwardness, moreover, left the empire at the mercy of certain predatory European powers with imperial aspirations. Foreign states like Russia and Austria were not above stirring up nationalism to destabilize Ottoman societies in the Balkan region. By the mid-19th century, Britain and France particularly controlled the Ottoman Empire's economy through loans extended to keep the government afloat. In short, this was not a winning strategy, and the conservative and pro-Islamist government of Abdul Hamid did not help matters either. Certain forward-looking elites believe that if this state of affairs continued, the empire would be broken apart and parceled out among the European powers. In order to stop this from occurring, reform was essential. Barring that, only a revolution would suffice in bringing about the necessary changes needed to restore Ottoman power and hegemony. In this atmosphere, reform-minded officials, journalists, and conspirators began to contemplate a new approach to Ottoman politics, what became known as Ottomanism. In short, this program sought to promote a specific brand of Ottoman patriotism. It called for the creation of a constitutional and parliamentary government to curb the powers of the Sultan. Modernizing elites also sought to abolish religious laws for Christians, Jews, and Muslims, replacing them with a uniform civic code applicable to everybody. In short, these thinkers sought to transform the old multi-ethnic empire into a civic nation, much like France and Britain. In this way, Ottomanism would put an end to the ethnic tensions that continually disrupted the empire. It would establish a centralized government that could promote economic and political modernization. It would do away with the old conservative regime of the sultans and Islamic clerics and allow progressive and modernizing bureaucrats to set things straight. Saving the empire meant nationalizing the empire to a certain extent. It meant integrating its many ethnic and religious groups into a single state and people. Naturally, the Hamidian government was hostile to these proposals. It had little desire to implement constitutional reforms that would diminish the Sultan's power. Islamic officials and religious conservatives were equally opposed to it. The idea of abandoning the law of the Sharia was anathema. In no uncertain terms, such a proposal meant undermining Muslim society at its very core. Consequently, the government cracked down on these opponents, either driving them underground 
or into exile. However, this hardly put an end to the matter. In 1895, a group of Ottoman exiles began meeting in Paris, and there formed an organization which assumed the name of the Committee of Union and Progress, or the CUP. The circle of Parisian exiles were vocal critics of Abdul Hamid and the conservative establishment. In their view, the current government was directly responsible for the declining fortunes of the Ottoman Empire. They denounced the regime as a brutal police state, pressing for democratic reform in the name of progress. More importantly, however, the CUP's message struck a chord with audiences back home. This was especially the case when it came to other like-minded thinkers within the military and government who were frustrated with the paralyzed state of politics in the empire. While the CUP might have acted from abroad, it was in constant contact with influential groups at home. In a very real sense, it served as an umbrella organization that drew together the various points of opposition growing up within Ottoman society. The core of the Unionists had a radical streak, and these men had no qualms about acting as a secret party. They were even willing to entertain the prospect of revolution should the Hamidian government refuse to change. In contrast to the old regime of the Sultan, these men took up a counter-identity. They branded themselves Young Turks, activists dedicated to modernizing the Ottoman Empire and saving it from the nationalist separatist movements and predatory European imperialism that persistently threatened the empire. And the dire need to save the empire was becoming painfully evident, especially as events in the Balkan region began to cast the very future of the empire into doubt. The Ottoman dynasty had ruled over the southeast corner of Europe since the 15th century. Yet despite centuries of Ottoman rule, the Balkans had remained a peripheral and contentious region for much of the empire's history. The majority of the Slavic Christians that inhabited the region had never adopted Islam, and various Slavic community leaders resented the preferential treatment the state showed toward Muslim subjects. These evident social tensions acquired a new dynamic during the 19th century, as Balkan Slavs increasingly took up nationalist programs. The more practical movements sought greater equality and autonomy within a reworked Ottoman system. A minority, however, formed underground nationalist organizations seeking to liberate themselves from Istanbul. In 1902, Bulgarian anarchists terrorized the city of Salonika in Ottoman Macedonia, attacking officials and even blowing up the Ottoman National Bank. Serb and Greek nationalists were equally becoming more radical as the years progressed, with militants running guns and mobilizing organized movements against the government. For wary Ottoman administrators taking note of these developments, the situation appeared a powder keg. It was only a matter of time before it exploded. As the situation in the Balkans deteriorated, the young Turks lashed out against Abdul Hamid. In their opinion, years of inept state policies and conservative rule were the cause of this evident imperial decline. Turkish residents in the Balkan area were also irate. Nationalist groups were actively perpetrating terror and violence on civilian populations, and the state appeared incapable of protecting its subjects. In this growing chorus of discontent, the army as well showed signs of protest. Military commanders stationed in Macedonia had grown hostile to the bureaucrats in the capital the military had been waging a war against Balkan nationalism for over a decade, and the government's dwindling funds meant that the army 
frequently went without pay for long periods and lacked adequate weapons to defend itself. Under the circumstances, troops garrisoned in places like Macedonia and Salonika, on the western fringe of the empire, increasingly pursued policies independent of the military administration in the capital. Discontent was growing within the ranks of the military, and this could only spell trouble for the regime in Istanbul. Given the situation, it was unsurprising that these Balkan garrisons also proved to be hotbeds of young Turk radicalism. The army command began to speak out openly against the Sultan, who they believed was no longer capable of holding the empire together. It was, they insisted, time for genuine reforms, and if the Sultan did not consent, he would have to go. For his part, Abdul Hamid knew that he had to curb the growing resistance in the military. In the summer of 1908, therefore, he sent troops to Macedonia with the plan of removing rowdy commanders and reasserting control over the armed forces. This proved to be a fatal mistake. When imperial forces arrived in Salonika, troops garrisoned in the city staged a mutiny. Within a week, the unrest spread to Istanbul. Street demonstrations broke out. Military officers made bold speeches that enthralled crowds. Declaring their message on squares and in the street, they encouraged Ottoman citizens to come together to pledge their love and devotion to the Ottoman fatherland. More insistently, they demanded a constitution be issued and a parliament set up. As one of the chief CUP conspirators and military ringleaders, Enver Bey proclaimed to an enthusiastic crowd, the era of the old regime was finished. Citizens, we are all brothers, he stated. Ottomanism was now the order of the day. In a matter of days, Mutiny had been transformed into a Young Turk revolution, one that pledged to forge a new nation through constitutional reform and bureaucratic modernization. However, the question remained whether the initial success in Macedonia and Istanbul could be replicated throughout the vast empire. Moreover, were the Young Turks, a group which had operated on the fringes of Ottoman political society, as liberal as they made themselves out to be. These questions had yet to be answered as the Sultanic government collapsed. The Young Turks had no intention of letting events take their own course. From the start of the revolution, CUP affiliates seized control of the bureaucracy in an effort to steer the course of the revolution. Talat Pasha, a member of the CUP party branch in Salonika, took over the Ministry of the Interior and began systematically purging all former Hamidian loyalists. Career military men and long-term state officials were released from duty and replaced by CUP loyalists responsible to the party's central committee. The religious establishment was hardly spared. Conservative clerics and religious scholars were discharged from their duties or marginalized. In their drive to modernize the empire, the Young Turks intended to usher in secular reforms, sidelining Islamic authorities who preached loyalty to the Caliph. When the Sultan protested against these measures, the Young Turks ordered armed naval ships into the harbor, aiming the gunboats directly at the royal palace. Young Turk leaders might make declarations in the name of constitutional principles, but they were not above using strong-arm tactics to obtain their goals. Was this a revolution or a coup, liberals suddenly asked. And over the next year, it started to seem as though the latter were the case. Fears of a CUP dictatorship 
provoked protests and demonstrations, and these in turn brought a heavy-handed response from the revolutionaries. More troubling was the fact that outside the capital, the revolutionary movement was acquiring its own dynamics. Minority groups interpreted the revolution in their own ways, and they saw it as a chance to secure autonomy from the state and enact a system of local self-rule that would end their reliance on Istanbul. Arab activists in Syria and the Hejaz were particularly energetic. They published newspapers, held local assemblies, and formed civic associations. These organizations drew in merchants and professionals who supported Ottomanism. Yet they understood Ottomanism in their own terms. For them, revolution entailed an autonomous society, one in which Arab and local leaders would be free to administer their own community as they saw fit. This was how many groups understood the promise of liberty and constitutionalism and it ran counter to young Turk desires for imperial unity and a new union of Ottoman peoples. In fact, for many young Turk hardliners, these demonstrations in favor of local liberty hinted at nationalist separatism. They threatened the very base of the empire and as such could not be tolerated. As the revolution wore on, Nationalist separatism became one of the most daunting challenges at hand. Yet it was not merely dissident minorities the CUP faced. European powers, just as much as nationalist leaders, took advantage of the revolutionary unrest on settling the empire. In 1908, just as the Young Turks were securing their hold on Istanbul, Austria annexed Bosnia-Herzegovina and Bulgaria declared outright independence. The CUP's ability to defend the empire had been cast into doubt from the very beginning, and this situation only grew worse over the coming years as everyone attempted to secure a piece of the crumbling empire. In 1911, Italy violated international law when it invaded Ottoman Libya in an effort to secure a North African colony for itself. With few resources at hand to repel the Italians, the CUP was compelled to ally with Arab clients in the region. It funneled arms to Sufi leaders on the ground and made appeals to pan-Islamic unity, urging Muslims to come to the defense of the Ottoman fatherland against the European infidel. The most startling affront came from neighboring Balkan states. In a series of conflicts between 1912 and 1913, Greece, Serbia, and Bulgaria took it upon themselves to carve up the Ottoman Balkans. In a vicious cycle of violence, the three states aggressively seized any swaths of territory they could, effectively putting an end to Ottoman rule in Europe. By 1913, the CUP faced a dire situation. Embattled at home and besieged from abroad, it appeared the Ottoman Revolution was on the brink of complete collapse, and with it, the fortunes of the Ottoman Empire itself. The sense of crisis that loomed after 1908 was not necessarily one of the Young Turks' making. Nonetheless, it did influence the course of the Young Turk Revolution, pushing revolutionaries to consider more extreme and authoritarian measures. It was hard to deny that as these crises unfolded, the government was becoming reliant on the military. Men like Enver Bey, who commanded forces in both Libya and the Balkans, progressively assumed a more direct role in state affairs. As the military took charge, the initial liberal aspirations of the revolution diminished. In 
In a more general sense, territorial losses reshape perceptions of Ottomanism. The major losses incurred were in areas with large Christian populations like the Balkans. After 1912, demographic realities indicated the empire was now a primarily Turkish and Arab-speaking Muslim state. If Ottomanism had been a strategy for binding together a multi-ethnic population, Islamism was now a more effective means of encouraging imperial unity. The persistent threat of secessionist nationalism also nurtured a pathological suspicion of ethnic minorities. CUP radicals were inclined to look upon ethnic Turks as the only reliable population in the empire. Consequently, a more pronounced sense of Turkic nationalism took root. Organizations with names like the Turkish Hearth were given support in sponsoring cultural events and disseminating propaganda, signaling a turn away from an Ottoman-centric worldview to one focused on ideas of Turkic nationalism and belonging. Zia Gürkop, a key advocate of Turkish nationalism within the CUP, became a chief ideologue of the new nationalist ideology growing up. As he and his associates spun it, Ottoman regeneration was now a matter of national revival. Contrary to the cosmopolitan liberalism of many Ottomanists, a new type of utopia was being peddled by revolutionaries. It was not the multi-ethnic and liberal civic nationalism of 1908, Rather, it was a pronounced Turkish nationalism. This reactionary utopianism found its way into state social and economic projects. Policymakers began calling for the resettlement and expulsion of undesirable groups like the Slavs, Armenians, and Kurds. As the empire succumbed to secessionist movements, minority groups became suspect. The interior minister, Talat Pasha, played a leading role in designing these policies as the state condoned ethnic cleansing and reimagined Ottoman society as a Turco-Islamic empire. Beginning in 1913, Talat organized plans to forcibly resettle non-Turkish populations across Anatolia in order to thin out minority groups. Once isolated, Non-Turk communities were to be subject to aggressive nationalizing policies in education and government, compelling assimilation. In short, Turkification became the operating policy of state, proposing a radical plan committed to salvaging the remaining empire. This defensive strategy was telling. By 1914, the Young Turk Revolution had morphed into a distinctly different type of modernizing project. As war and national separatism spread, the cosmopolitan Ottomanism of 1908 fell to the wayside. More troubling was the fact that these various challenges left the constitutional government utterly debilitated. Revolution, warfare, and ethnic strife had enervated liberals leaving them impotent. With the empire on the verge of complete collapse, CUP radicals felt little remorse in exerting themselves with greater force. Enver seized the war ministry, and Talat clamped down on interior affairs. Constitutionalism was put on ice as the so-called government of the Pashas took control of the fragile situation and pushed through a nationalist and modernizing revolution from above. These abrupt shifts beg the question, what type of revolution was the Young Turk program? What had begun as a civic and constitutional movement in 1908 had, by 1913, taken an illiberal and nationalist turn. With the imminent threat of war and disintegration persistently looming over radicals, 
there appeared little room for liberal debate or parliamentary rule. As the Young Turks broke down the structures of the old multi-ethnic empire, a pent-up Turkish nationalism came to the surface, finding expression among officials and soldiers alike in response to a collapsing situation. Modernization had aimed to transform a multi-ethnic empire into a national one. But in the crucible of war, this modernizing drive assumed more aggressive and extremist forms, sending the Young Turk Revolution along a different course. With the CUP now implementing revolution from above, the Ottoman Empire found itself in the midst of a dramatic transformation. The rule of the sultans was finished, but as to whether Ottoman revolutionaries would in fact found a liberal and democratic regime had yet to be seen. <laughs>